Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. Whitetail Rendezvous is pleased to announce a partnership with GoHunt.com. Who's GoHunt.com? Well, if you're a DIY hunter, you need the information at GoHunt.com forward slash insider. Why? Because it provides 4,200 profiles, every unit, every species, and every season. Furthermore, they give in-depth analysis, interactive maps, unit access, and seasonal trends. Draw odds are very important, and they give you the most accurate information in the business. All this is available when you go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider. Make sure you use promo code WR2017 when you join Insider. You'll get a $50 gift card for GoHunt.com gear shop. All in all, if you're hunting out west in 2018, GoHunt.com Insider is where you need to be to get all the research information. When you use promo code WR2017, Whitetail Rendezvous receives a small commission from GoHunt.com. We are live today, and we're heading out to uh, Pennsylvania, uh, New York border, and we're going to connect with Amy Hunter. Now, Amy isn't like your typical outdoor lady. Well, maybe she is. First of all, she's a preschool teacher. Second, she's a mom. I, probably a lot of people can check that off. Three, uh, she part-time runs a bow shot and helps with the, the lanes and helps people get set up on their bows. And she loves to spend time on the line for IBO. And I'm just I'm just trying to think of some of the other things that you do, Amy, but that's a good enough to get get us started. So welcome to the show and, and say hi to the folks out here in uh Whitetail Rendezvous land. Hi everybody. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited about it tonight. Well I'm excited too because um you represent uh women in the outdoors represent the fastest growing segment. Uh, ergo, the most important segment for manufacturers and advertisers and people that, you know, want to get their product seen. Why do you think that is? Why, why do you think women are, are just are just bouncing men as far as, you know, getting a hold of uh, uh, promotional uh, opportunities? I think more in the past. Well, I was born in the 70s. So in my lifetime, I've seen women go from. My mother never worked outside of the household to now there's seems like there's really a mom that stays home full time anymore. And women are just we're out there on the front lines working as hard as men do, really. If there's something a man can do, we want to do it just as good, if not better, I think. <laughs> and I, well, I, really... I think that's that's a very true statement. There's yeah. there's not much fluff in that or and everybody listening to the show certainly recognizes that. And it's the drive and determination uh, that is making uh, women extremely, extremely successful. And you could just look in in uh, Pursuit Channel or Sportsman Channel mm-hmm. and, and see that ladies all by the lonesomes, um, you know, are, are carrying the mail. So salute to you, ma'am. Thank you. It's nice to go on to the Outdoor Channel or any of the sporting channels and see almost as many women now on the outdoor shows as there is men. It's it's great to see it. I hope it shows kids that are coming up now that you can be whatever you want to be. You know, it's not just a man-dominated world anymore. It's wonderful. Now, one thing I forgot in your uh, bio uh, or intro, um, shoot like a girl. You're on yeah. staff for that. What does that mean? Yes, I just was welcomed on as a staff member for shoot like a girl which uh, has been the brainchild, basically, of Christy Crawford out of Texas and a couple other women. And it is an introduction for women to shooting sports, be it handguns, long guns, archery. It gets women, gets these items in their hands, the correct poundage on the bows, things like that, where a woman can shoot it. It's not set up for a man. It's set up for them in a comfortable environment. And it's just an overall promotion of women in the shooting sport is the biggest part of it. So what do you actually do? Um, do you just go around the shops and talk or shows or well, Harrisburg or what do you do? Right now, 
Um, I'm hopeful to move up to be one of their instructors in the next year or so. But right now we do a number of different articles and social media events, uh, social media posts. And anytime we're out and about, it's just promote women in the shooting sports. And for myself, my biggest thing is women in archery. And that's uh, basically where we're at with that. They travel around the country with a wonderful tractor trailer that actually has a shooting range on it. It's set up with all sorts of guns and bows. And women come to the different shows and can put these in their hands and get a good kind of crash course on how to do things. Now, you yourself are an instructor there in uh, Pennsylvania. Is that correct? Yes. I'm a S3DA instructor. I just got my certification last year. I am trying to build up some youth programs at our shop. That's our biggest, you know, that's our bread and butter is getting these kids, getting the families in, getting the kids in, getting these bows in the kids' hands and teaching them, getting them hooked, basically. So, and then we go from there and we got IBO. But before we get in there, um, something about your son getting back in the, in the woods with a, with a bow in his hand. Oh, uh, yeah, I've been so happy for him this year. I, he hasn't got the bow in his hand yet. He hasn't got the weight, the poundage yet that I feel is ethical for him to use it. But he's been out with a gun. Uh, he's very handy with a gun. And this year was the first year he actually asked to go hunting in a number of years. And he wanted to come along with me when I went, uh, took my buck with my bow this year. And we just had a... It was a perfect setup. It was Halloween night. There was a perfect north wind. He could sit across about 100 yards across the field from me, and everything worked perfect. I had a doe come in with a buck chasing after her, and he was a good, mature buck. My son brought the binoculars up, and he was so excited. He says, Mom, I got to see you pull your bow back. I got to see you take the shot. I got to see the buck go down. He thought it was great. So he was instantly hooked back in it. He took uh, his own doe and his own buck this year. I'm really proud of him. What kind of rifle does he shoot? He has a, let me see, Weatherby 308. He's a slightly spoiled little guy, but he's a really good shot. So <laughs> <laughs> I believe in getting the right thing in his hand. You know, it was a gun we we won through a youth organization here, and it just seemed like a good, perfect fit for him. And, boy, he shoots it lights out. So that has turned into his gun. Uh, that's, that's great. So you got to be proud as a mother because, um, you know, to get him out there and the, have him just sit a, um, sit across the field and, and watch yeah. the whole thing rather than double set with you, you know, in the tree stand. I'm assuming you were in a tree stand. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he wanted to be in that tree stand, something fierce, but we only have single stands. We don't have any doubles. So as it turned out, he had to sit across the field, and it was so cold that night. It was right at freezing, and it was a stiff wind. And I'll tell you, I was standing in that tree praying for something to come by because I kept seeing his orange of his face go up and down and up and down, and I knew he was cold. So it worked out really well. And how, how old is he? He just turned 14 on Sunday. So I'm battling all that teenage stuff and good to get back into it. Sounds, sounds like you got somebody to hang with you, that's for sure. Now, yeah. what do you think? why do you think more moms or dads or both are taking their kids and experiencing, yeah, it was cold, it was windy, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't comfortable at all, but yeah. he wanted to be there. So what makes you so special, if you take my meaning? You know, I don't, uh, I don't know. It's been kind of an up and down road with him. He got into shooting pistol and clays for a long time, and I transitioned from just shooting backyard archery into shooting more competitively and got him into archery and like I said I battle that teenage thing a little bit with him but this year I really I put a lot into hunting this year I put a lot of time into preparing during the summer we spent a ton of time in the tree stands and honestly I just think he saw how passionate I was about it this year and it was just that right time in his life that he said up oh, I'm ready to get back to it uh, just hearing you, you know, uh, today, the passion you have, the drive you have is is, is, is nice to see. It's very nice to see because uh, a lot of people, yeah, well, I do this and do this, but, you know, you're you're really after it. So you take you take the honey part, you take working um, in the shop and 
then uh, all of a sudden you're shooting IBO. So mm -hmm. when do you have time to cut the grass? <laughs> well, I, my boyfriend does that. That's his job here at the house. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Thankfully, he runs a bow shop. So we're both, uh, you know, we're good match set. We're both into the same thing. We both have the same mindset. We both believe in the same thing. So it, it's, it's, we work as a good team with stuff, but it does not leave a lot of time around the edges. There's 6 a.m. Sunday wake up and you go move tree stands. And there's a lot of Sundays that I roll over and say, I'll meet you at 10. <laughs> but it's, it's a lot of work. I mean, and it's the, we say all the time, a lot of people don't put in this work. Even this late in the season, we were just, uh, we have our late archery season starts on the 26th. And we have a lot of stands out there from the fall, which may or may not be good stands at the moment. We really would have liked to get some time in there, but you just run out of hours in the day. You got to pay the bills sometimes, and we run out of hours in the day. Now, when you say the stands might not be any good, is that because of travel patterns? Is that because of food sources? Help me understand that uh, statement. Well, we have a lot of land that we've been really fortunate to be able to hunt on and for years it's been left it's probably 75 percent wooded but the fields were left hay or straw or just left you know the deadhead and this year they put corn in so it changed our game plan considerably we moved, moved stands around the edge of the cornfield a couple times the corn got cut uh opening rifle weekend which was great Thanksgiving weekend here in Pennsylvania. So that changes patterns, rut changes patterns, the late rut changes patterns. <laughs> and now we're getting cold weather again, so that'll change it for us too. So you really have to stay on top of it. You can't stick a stand in a tree and hope they're going to meander past for three, four months. Yeah, and just a comment on that. You know, if you've got a pinch point or funnel, geographic or whatever, mm -hmm. um, sometimes they're good all the time. Sometimes, right. sometimes they're all good uh, because I think it's some of the stands we have on our farm um, and they always produce, you know, yeah. um, year in, year out. It doesn't take some effort. Yeah, you got to sit the stand, but year in, year out, I, I know just a couple, you know, uh, that nice bucks, nice mature bucks are taken every single year off those. But then again, some other stands, they're one year they're hotter than a pancake. Mm -hmm. Or crack a jack, and the next year you go, there ain't no deer here. Yeah. They're gone. They're they not coming go? by. <laughs> what did I do? Yeah. You know, what yeah. did I do? You know, to screw this up. You did absolutely nothing. It's right. A, right. So, something changed, and you you just need to find out because the deer is still here, but you got to find out and adapt to where they are. Because I don't care. You can sit in a stand in the corner of a cornfield, looks great, and you see some cracks and stuff, but you never see a deer, and you go, oh, well. What's up with this? And exactly. the deer are telling you, I'm not coming. You know, I'm I'm not coming by that stand, no matter right. what you do. Right. Oh, and I think that's what a lot of people don't realize is that most white tail hunters in our area know it you gotta play the wind, you gotta play weather, things like that. But like you said, there's funnels or there could be somebody a mile away moving deer around or farm machinery going and you don't really realize it. You've got to be really aware of all those things around you and how it changes the patterns on our deer. But we have areas that continually produce every single time. You know, if it's like it was a doe week for youth, uh, disabled veterans and mentored youth, I think had a week early in October. And it was just an area, you know, I could put my son in and within an hour it paid off for him. That's kind of that guaranteed spot on the farm that we hunt. But other times you spend all summer thinking this is great. We've got these bucks funneling through here, and week into season they're gone. <laughs> uh, I had a conversation with Dan Smith, who's the editor of Deer Deer Hunting. He hunts seventy plus acres, and he had five bucks on his hit list. Mm -hmm. And this is in Central Wisconsin, plenty of deer around him, and so forth and so on. And then he said, Bruce, he couldn't he couldn't believe it because come come. Uh, Bow hunting season and even rifle season, he said they just left. They were mm -hmm. gone. It is. And they just become ghosts and they're gone. <laughs> but then the I was just talking last week and then said you never believe it, but Monday on our cameras one of these bucks show up again. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's where 
I'm hoping. I have my fingers crossed because we have, um, it was up to 52 degree, degrees today on the playground, and it's supposed to be snow on Christmas Day here. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed that that's what's going to happen, and that change in the barometric pressure might bring the big guys back around. They might be a little more relaxed again and get a chance to see some good deer. And out in Colorado, I think we're going to be five on Christmas Eve. Uh, we are five going degrees. to be... I believe I saw it was a high of like 26 on the 26th. So it's going to be a cold opener day for us, but that's all right. <laughs> well, just get out there early and you, you'll be done early. Yeah. That's well, I, that's... I, honestly, I I try my best, but I have always shot everything late in the day. I have more success on wherever. I guess I'm lucking the, the luck of the draw. I always hit in good feed patterns and get them at the end of the day, moving off or on you know, betting. So we'll see. I have one more doe tag burning a hole in my pocket. <laughs> well, I'd sleep in myself. Yeah, I like to, too. <laughs> I'd sleep in and just, you know, go out there an hour before you want to kill your doe, kill your doe, and get the heck out yeah, of there. that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. That's really funny. Yeah, I don't, you know, I don't have anybody on my hit list. I always tend to, I look for a mature buck, but I... My last two racks the past few years have been kind of, you wouldn't, they're not typical. You know, they've either had something broken off in a fight or a little smaller on one side than the other. I always look for kind of the oddball out when I'm hunting. I guess it's sort of always been the score I have. Worked for me. I had a beautiful shot on what I thought was a good deer first hour of opening day. Uh, he had a nice full size on one side and just a teeny little mini of the exact same size. And crawled him crazy eight. I thought I got a beautiful arrow on him, and I think I just nicked him. And we did see him come back on cameras. He looked happy, healthy, so he'll be there for next year. Crazy eight. Yeah. Now, are you are you near that that uh, nuclear plant where you get all no, this crazy stuff? No, they're way south. <laughs> <laughs> I know which one you mean. It's down in Turbotville, I think it is, but they're pretty south of us. Yeah, I'm just thinking if you're getting all these crazy, crazy uh, frames, but, you know, maybe maybe something's got to do with that. I don't know. I don't know. I always seem to find one every year that has something just a little different about them, but that's the one that kind of sparks me, and I look for them. And at the end of the day, I'm a meat hunter. You know, I, I everybody sure. says the horns are nice, but you can't eat them. So if I'm taking a nice-bodied buck, I'm happy with that, as long as it's an ethical kill that makes me happy. Yeah, I I couldn't be happier because you know the some of the great times are next season when we're sitting around the bunkhouse and uh, drinking a beer or having a soda and, mm -hmm. and watching the Packers play and we got we got cheese and crackers and venison and that's you know, it. <laughs> no, that that's pretty darn good actually. That's exactly right. Yep. That's that's pretty damn good. And then you get your you know venison stew and all that other stuff, but. You know, that's what we hunt for. We hunt for the following year to feed ourselves, you know. Yeah, I, I haven't made that, um, I haven't hit that point in being a hunter that I'm only out there looking for racks yet. I'm still, I'm still pretty happy with looking for a big body deer and taking him home that day, so. Yeah, and there's no, you know, I get to get there if you want to. I, yeah, I've got oh, a couple yeah. of bucks on, on my wall and I'm happy with them, but I put a buck on a wall because the deer behind me is just the prettiest white tail I've ever seen or yep. ever ever shot. And, you know, he's not the biggest deer, not the smallest deer. He's just gorgeous, gorgeous deer. And that's why I shot him. Yeah, mine this year that I took with my son there was only a seven point. He bested me and he got an eight point this year. But we're going to put it on the wall because it was just that memory. It was just the perfect night with my son on Halloween night. So... I'm going to have a funny-looking little seven-point mounted on the wall, and it'll be the best year I ever took, I guarantee you. <laughs> yeah, it'll, it'll stand through time, that's yep. for sure. Yep. You know, you think about what we're talking about. Why do we have these conversations? And Because there's some people out there that go, what are these guys talking about, guys and gals talking about? You know, what it's, is it? it's funny. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, but what in your mind, Really, what is it? Because we we don't know each other, but we, yet we're friends and we're talking about mm -hmm. things that we love. And it, it's pretty easy to have a conversation. It's, you know, I thought about this all day today as I was preparing for this. 
um, I had a little trepidation thinking, boy, what are we going to talk about? And I just started thinking back to the thing that really, I guess, lit that spark for me was growing up and watching my father and my uncles and their male friends. Every year, I grew up in southern New Jersey, so every year, the day after Thanksgiving, they loaded up with their, you know, flannel and all their guns and their, all their snacks and stuff, and they headed up north to Pennsylvania to hunt deer for a week. They would call a couple times during the week, and they'd come home with the best stories, and they had the best time, and the pictures they showed, and it just, back then, it wasn't, there was never even a thought of me going or being asked to go hunting. It was a guys only kind of club, but that camaraderie that they had has always struck me as that one thing that I just, I want to pass it down to my son. You know, it's the feeling of you have something in common with somebody that hunts, you know, where it's a connection to the animal. It's a connection to the land, you know, it's a connection to what God's given us. And that's, I have that memory of how they looked and how much fun they had hunting when I was a kid, and it still means something to me. It's a big deal. You know, we always joke it's hunting season eve, and we're all excited, just like it's Christmas Eve. <laughs> yeah, it pretty much is. I, You know, our whole crew, which you're uh, involved in, in Whitetail Rendezvous, I've had over 200,000 listeners, and every one of them hunts. I mean, think yeah. about that. And that's just the people I've reached out and in touch with and, and, and had conversations with. It's just, it's re- truly remarkable that even with all the other crap going on in our lives, we still come back to this tradition. We still come back to this opportunity. And for the opportunity to sit in a freezing stand with the wind blowing, just in case maybe sort of kind of a, a buck or two will walk by. That's crazy. Exactly. Yeah, you sit there with the, the heater thing stuck all over you, shivering, thinking, why am I out here? Why am I out here? And then the second you get home, you think, boy, when can I go again? <laughs> yep. Yeah, we're, we're pretty weird. So um, the girl thing, are you, in, are you on any other pro staffs other than, you know, shooting life? Uh, nope. Uh, this is the first year that I have stepped out and kind of chased any sort of sponsorship. I Last year was the first year I joined IBO and became a state rep with them. I'm a New York state rep, actually. And I shot, I had a lot of personal goals to shoot in the female hunter class with that. I exceeded every one of them. It was a lot of work, but I set some goals that made me happy and I got through them. And I have thought about it all winter. And this is the year I'm starting to chase some sponsorships. And I would like to maybe next year move up to semi-pro and pro with IBO and really kind of step my shooting up to the next level. But I shoot for Shoot Like a Girl, and um, I'm on the pro staff there at the bow shop as well. Now, are you going to ATA? We were back and forth about it and back and forth about it. But honestly, I'd rather take the time off from work and spend the money possibly to go to the Triple Crown for IBO instead. Okay. (laughs) So. We're going to stay home, and I'm probably going to head out uh, on the three shoots for that instead, I think. Because I know um, Brittany Glaze and Nikki Tilly uh, were at the, that last year, and they did very well for sponsorships. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that's kind of the where you can see more people in a shorter period of time than in anything. Yeah. You know, just introducing yourself. This is what I do. This is how I represent. And, uh, you know, go from there. And that's kind of a, it, it's a double-edged sword to me. I'm, my shooting is a, it's kind of a private thing to me. It's something I really work hard at. If I stumble, I stumble. I, I, you know, I'm the first one to say I didn't put enough time in, and there's certain things that I didn't reach that maybe I, you know, really wanted to. And when you start searching for those sponsorships, you have to really be sure it's a company you want to work with, and you're using their items, and you're proud of them you're proud of what they do for you because i've seen a lot of people get locked into this hollywood glamour of i want sponsorships it's going to make me a better shooter when it really doesn't at the end of the day it's the hours you spend in front of the bag pulling the bow back basically yeah yeah and sponsorships you know it's it's good to have but it uh, you better know what you're doing i guess i would say that yes absolutely you don't want to go out and misrepresent them that you know, then it's kind of, it ruins the whole thing for you all the way around. 
I don't know. It, it, it's like I said, it's the first year I'm going to sort of start chasing a few things and see if maybe next year I can start stepping into that pro bracket a little bit and push myself. It's just a challenge. That's all it is. It's one of those, I feel like I can do it. Let's see where it goes. I love to shoot. I love seeing women in the sport. I feel if I can step up like that, it gives more women, you know, the opportunity to think they can too. I'm not a 21-year-old kid, you know. I'm in my mid-40s. I want people to think, hey, at any point in my life, I can step up and try something new and do good at it. Yep, and it's all a matter of attitude. You know, yeah. that's all it is. I mean, absolutely. There's too many examples of people. I've got a friend, Kenny Maynard, out in Kentucky, and um, he can't use his left arm, military mm-hmm. service, so forth and so on. And so he um, pulls his bow back with his teeth. He has a, you know, a mm-hmm. mouthpiece type of thing. Mm-hmm. And you see this kid shoot. I mean, it's like, oh my goodness. Yeah, that's amazing. We got to meet that, uh, the. Oh, I can't remember what his name is. The armless shooter that shoots for Hoyt. I feel terrible now that I can't bring his name to mind right away. But we just got to watch him shoot live about a month ago at an outdoor show here in New York. And that was one of the most, it almost gives you chills to sit and watch this person tell his story of what he went through. And, you know, he shoots so he doesn't even think twice about it, just like I do. It's amazing. Yep, it is amazing. That's for dang sure. Let's talk about the, we'll go to, to gear tech right now. What's the last piece of gear that you bought and why'd you buy it? Uh, I'm waiting right now on the brand new Triax bow from Matthews. Um, I've previously shot a, I'm a Matthews gal, so I've shot their Chill SDX. That's what I competed with last year. I shot a Halon 6 uh, the year before. And we got the Triax in the shop, and I pulled it back and fell in love. It, it, it's an unbelievable bow. So now I'm waiting. I'm hoping that's going to be sort of the next step up in my game that'll push me a little further. No, you said you just picked it up, pulled it back, and you were, you know, you were in love with, with the bow. Why? What does that mean to a non a non shooter? Somebody said, well, how could that be? I mean, it's just a bow. Uh, yeah, yeah I'm, I would have agreed with that a couple years ago before I, st- I started to shoot competitively. I had an old, oh, I think it's a 1970-something Browning bow, terrible, beastly thing, and I shot it in the backyard, had a ball with it. And the more I started competing, the more I started thinking, oh, you know, I want this little thing to work a little better or that to work a little bit better. And my SDX that took me through, it, it took me through everything last year. I had the best time shooting that bow, and I tried out Matthew's Avail that they brought out last year, and it's almost the exact same, felt to me like almost the exact same platform. I could shoot them blindfolded and barely tell any difference between the two. When I picked up the Triax, they've done some different dampening with it. It's silent in your hand. You don't get that kind of recoil feeling. And when you're making shots and the silent, you have to have that quietness in your hand, that little extra bit that they put into that bow this year made that after the shot follow through so much more quiet. And it's a big deal when you're shooting competitively. I shoot against some women that just, it's an honor to shoot with them. They used to scare me, you know, they used to be my, oh, I want to beat this one or I want to beat that one. And now I've shot around with them enough and it's an honor to shoot with them. They make you step up your game, and they make you start thinking about little things like that. You know, how can I get the one little advantage that might make my arrow fly a little flatter, a little straighter, a little faster, a little quieter? (laughs) Now, on your tournament, how far are you shooting? Right now, this past year, uh, the hunter female hunter class was a max of 30 yards. I just two nights ago was sitting here discussing uh, with Don that I'm going to step up to the next class is a female release class, which will be 35 yards. So I know it doesn't sound like much to maybe somebody that doesn't shoot. They say, what's the difference between 15 feet? But it's a lot of difference. Um, The step up to pro will give me another 10 yards on top of that. So moving from 30 to 35 this year, it just gives you a little better visual practice every time you go out there. That five extra yards is really going to make a difference, I hope, in my game this year. Now, in shooting, uh, what you do is 100 the point total, or you want 10 tens, or help me out uh, no, what actually, a score? No, actually, the IBO scoring that we do has 
typically all of their, what they call kill shots, is your normal kill shot for an animal. If we're shooting a deer, uh, the X ring, which will be 11 points, would be right where your optimal shot would be. If you were going to double lung them, that'd be right where you want it to hit. There's another circle that comes out about an inch around that. That's 10 points. Then there's a little bit bigger circle that's only eight points. The rest of the body is five points. And then, of course, if you miss, that's a big old zero, <laughs> which we all do now and then. So you want to go for that teeny little X ring, which is typically only the size sometimes of, on the smaller animals, it's the size of a dime. So when you're standing 30 yards away and you're trying to hit something the size of a dime, it gets a little difficult, especially if you get Mother Nature thrown in there and she gives you some rain and some wind. Because <laughs> you're outside, right? Yes. We do shoot indoors. Uh, we're just getting ready to gear up at our shop uh, in January where we shoot an indoor 3D lead where we bring the same animals inside. It's just a little bit shorter distances, but it still gives you a little bit of practice, keeps your arm in shape during the winter. So here we are, um, three suggestions, tips that you would give the women that are listening to the show about anything about what you're doing. Don't be afraid to go in the pro shop. That, I think, was my biggest fear, was being able to walk in a pro shop. Don't be scared to go in. Go in and ask. If you don't want to ask for the help from a man, go in and ask for the help from a woman. I bet you they can find you one that will make you more comfortable. Uh, my second biggest thing is don't shoot your husband's or your boyfriend's equipment. It's never, ever going to fit you. Go out and spend the time getting something for you. And my third biggest one is go ahead and make the mistake. My first few years of hunting were terrible. I've made some terrible shots on deer. I've lost deer. Um, it's the same with any sport. I fish too, and I've done things with that that I take back. But go try it. Go make the mistake. It's all right. Try gear until you find that right piece for you. Thanks for that. And I hope our listeners uh, take that to heart. Let's close up the show with your, your go-to hunting techniques. You know, what's the technique that you use all the time to close the deal? Uh, for me, um, I'm a person that stands all the time. It's kind of a point of controversy in our house. I have a, it's basically a cup. I can set my bow on my thigh, and so I can hold my bow in the same straight-up position of where you would shoot it. So I don't ever hang my, ho my bow on the hook, and I don't sit. I stand almost the entire time that I'm in my tree stand. For me, it gives you that <clears throat> gives you that extra second. I'm not standing up. I'm not reaching for my bow. I'm not trying to be quiet. I'm not trying to get into position. I know it makes for a long sit, but if you do the homework, you don't have to sit in your stand for 12 hours and hope something comes by. You know, there's days you do it just because you want to. But for me, I've always got my bow in my hand. I've always got my release on my string. And my ears open, I guess. That's the biggest thing. I think I, I'm just running through my gray matter. I haven't heard of somebody standing the whole time. Them, oh, yeah, my, I do. <laughs> no, I, I just haven't. Uh, I don't, nope. you know. Um, and when I was in hang on, yeah, I, I would stand the whole time when I was hunting hand axe. But now that I'm ladder stand, um, I don't. I just thought about that. Even when I'm in a blind, I'm sitting down. If I'm in the ground blind, I'm sitting down. Right. So, I don't do much ground blind hunting. The only time I've been in a ground blind to hunt was with my son with a gun. Um, this past two years was the first two years I've ever shot out of a tree stand. So that's been kind of a new learning experience. But before that, we always did um, spot and stalk hunting. And I think that might be where my tendency to want to stand in the tree stand is because when you spot and stalk, you don't sit on the ground and wait for something to go by. You're always kind of moving and leaning against the tree and listening. And I don't know, like I said, it's a big point of contention here in our household that, you know, why don't you sit down and hang your bow up for a few minutes? But I don't know, for me, it's I, I like to be at that ready and that standing kind of keeps me on my toes, keeps me more alert. I'm less likely to fall asleep because I have done that when I sat down in my tree stand. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness for the harnesses. <laughs> Got that right. Yeah. Yeah, and I was thinking if you're standing up, then you get your harness, and, and you can kind of lean forward into your harness, yep. and that'll help support you. Yeah, 
Yeah, there has been times where I've leaned around the tree and leaned into that harness a little bit. And, you know, when you're shooting out of a tree stand, sometimes that back elbow, if you're standing in too close, you hit in on the tree. And having that harness in, you can kind of lean out a little bit and tie around a little bit, and it helps get you in a better position. Yeah, I agree. Well, Amy, this has just been a joy. Amy Hunter, thank you so much for spending some time with you. I know we didn't do a lesson plan, so you can give me an F on the class, I guess. <laughs> you did great. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks but for I having think, me. I really enjoyed it. I think this went pretty well, and you're a great student. You get you get an A. <laughs> hey, thank you. <laughs> you and your family just have a Merry Christmas, and, and I'll let you know when the show's going to be uh, aired. Thank you. You do the same, Bruce. I really appreciate it. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. On the next show, Ryan Campbell joins us from Georgia. He's been hunting the same family land that his grandfather hunted, and they're bow hunters. They don't hunt with rifles. Not because they can't, they just choose not to. They also hunt squirrels and rabbits, but more so than anything, they're stewards of the land. And I think you're going to hear Ryan tell all about being stewards of the land down in Georgia. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.